They started off like any other, up at 6 a.m. to go work job number one. It was July 19th, a Tuesday. It had been an extremely hot and dry summer so far in New York. I showered, dressed, jumped in my work truck, and headed out the door. Work up until 2 p.m. had been uneventful. The usual dirty houses and unpleasant customers. I was running a cable line when a customer yelled, What did you do? I thought to myself, Did I drill into an electric line? In 13 years, I'd never hit one. She said her power just went out because of me. I assured her I didn't do anything. Within minutes, neighbors started pouring out, saying their power was out too. At that moment, I looked up into the sky and seen a 767 falling to the ground. Holy shit. My prepper senses started tingling. EMP, I said aloud. It didn't register with my customer. I checked my cell phone, nothing but a black screen. I ran to my work van, turned the key, nothing. I'd read the book one second after, watched EMP videos and documentaries. I couldn't believe it. This was the real deal. I was the prepper type, the type my family and friends laughed at. In my work truck, I kept a get-home bag and a collapsible bike. The bike was a Stoa bike, MT, MTB mountain bike. I threw down my work tools, grabbed my get-home bag, unfolded the bike, and prepared to trek the 10 to 12 miles home. My customer yelled, where are you going? What about my cable? I didn't even give her a second thought. I work in the urban area, to say, to say it nicely. I couldn't carry my gun at work. All I had was my EDC knife, a cold steel recon, and in my get-home bag was a United States Marine Corps K-Bar. Of all the places to be, the middle of the ghetto was the last place I wanted to be in a time like this. At that moment, I thought about my kids and wife. My kids were at home on summer break. I didn't need to worry about tracking them down. My wife was at work. Fortunately, she works about a mile from our house in the suburbs. I knew it wouldn't be long before the sheeple started looting in the city. There were cars stalled all over. People were asking questions. They had no clue what was going on. I decided to go home first, check on my daughters and grab my gun before riding off to my wife's job. I knew chaos was only hours away. I figured a 10 to 12 ride home would take an hour or so. The forecasted high today was 94 degrees. I had four bottles of water, a life straw, and a Joan Stevens four-way key in my bag. Water wouldn't be a problem as much as being an overweight smoker would be. I decided to stick to the main roads as it was the quickest and shortest route. I was able to avoid the gridlock of cars, buses, and trucks blocking the roads. It was a quarter after three, and smoke was rising all over. I knew it was from fires from downed airplanes. I had only hoped one didn't come down in my neighborhood. I passed hundreds of people on my way home. I stopped for no one. My only concern was my family and their well-being. I kept an old-school wind-up watch on my get-home bag. By 4.20, I was pulling down my suburban street. <clears throat> With no garage opener, I ran around the back, unlocked the garage door, walked inside. Dad, you're home early. The power's out, my youngest said. I know, I said. Is Mom home yet? No luck. I yelled for my other daughter and told her to come down to the basement. By my tone, they knew something was wrong. I grabbed my water bob for my supplies, put it in the tub, and immediately began to fill it. I had my oldest grab buckets, pots, anything else that would hold water. I told her, don't ask questions, just do it. My basement was my bunker. It's where I stored six to nine months of food and water. I had an old metal garbage can... I had sealed and shielded as a Faraday cage. I had kept a set of walkie-talkies, a ham radio, crank radio. 
an old cell phone, and flashlights in there. It was the moment of truth as I removed the lid. Success! Everything had powered on. I handed them one of the walkies, told them lock the basement door. Stay down there and don't come up until I return with Mom. Turn the walkie to channel 16 and stay in contact. I had often practiced with my youngest on them. My part-time job was a mile from home and we often would test the range. I knew we'd be able to stay in contact while I biked to my wife's job. It was less than a mile away. With my walkie attached to my bag, my AR over my shoulder, I set out to bring my wife home. The town police department was about a driver and an eight iron away from my house. I worried, what if an off, what an officer would do if he seen me riding down the street with a semi-auto rifle over my shoulder? Would he draw on me? Would he know how serious the situation at hand is? No time to worry. I had to reunite the entire family. Within minutes, I arrived at my wife's job, still in range and in contact with my daughters. Her co-workers and herself were quite shocked to see me show up armed. Man. I told him the grid's down. Do you know what's going on? The response was, it's probably a brownout. I said, did anyone try and start their car? I told him it was an EMP. They had no idea what I was talking about. I told my wife it's time to go. But she said, I got 15 minutes left in my shift. She worked in an apartment complex as a leasing consultant with over 300 apartments. I told her, we need to go, and we need to go now. Uh, this is bad, and we're only going to get worse. A whole hell of a lot worse. She rode the bike. I jogged behind her, and off to home we went. I radioed to my kids that we were en route with an ETA of about 15 minutes. Three quarters of the way there, drenched in sweat, it happened. I vomited from the biking and the jogging. If only I would have stuck with it at the gym a year ago, I said to myself. We arrived home by 6 p.m. I pulled the three of them together and explained the seri seriousness of this situation at hand. The grid's down, there's no electric, there's no AC, there's no Wi-Fi, no cars. We're in a survival situation. There'll be no help from the police, the military, or government. I told them I prepped as best as I could for this. We've got plenty of food, 125 gallons of water stored in the basement, a pool, pond, and hot tub in the backyard, all full of water. The water, the water bob in the tub was full, and we had another 25 gallons worth my daughter filled with buckets and pots. I had a Coleman camp stove with 51 pound cans of propane, and had just bought a new 30 pound tank for my grill. I had hundreds upon hundreds of candles, flashlights, solar lights, and battery powered lights. Working for the cable company, I had amassed more AA, AAA, and CR123s than I'd ever be able to use. I felt good with our supplies. One thing I did worry about was cigarettes. I've been a smoker most of my adult life. I'd buy a pack a day every day. I flipped open my pack. I had six cigarettes left. I told my wife to fire up the grill, throw some steaks on. I had to run to make. She was also a smoker. I kept quite a bit of cash in my safe. Didn't trust the banks. Denominations from dollar bills up to hundred dollar bills. I also stacked silver, thanks to my buddy Tommy. I grabbed some of each, set off to the nearest gas station, which is about a half mile from my house. Walkie in one hand, my Mossberg 500 tactical in the other. I put my 50 round bandolier over my shoulder. By now neighbors were out everywhere. They gave me some strange looks. 
I knew civil unrest and looting was a good possibility. Wasn't going to take any chances. WROL was imminent. As a gas station came in view, I could hear the chaos. <clears throat> it's been a crazy day. I gotta have a cigarette right now. I can only imagine what a Walmart or Wegmans would look like. There must have been 30 to 40 people at the gas station. A line out the door. There were multiple signs saying, no cash, no service. For the past nine years, I had visited this location almost daily. Damn nicotine habit. I approached quietly, shotgun in the ready position. Everyone was caught by surprise to see me locked and loaded. People were offering watches and jewelry for ice, beer, and cigarettes. Cash ruled everything around us for now. The crowd was not happy to see someone armed, and for a moment I thought I may have made a mistake. I pulled out $200 and told Bill the cashier, give me as many packs of Marlboros as you can, and two bags of ice. At that moment I heard a man say, give me that money or I'll shoot. I turned around and saw what looked to be someone under the influence of drugs and alcohol with a Glock pointed to my head. I told him to ease up. My Mossberg can do a lot more damage. Before I could put my finger on the trigger, Bill smashed one of the craft beer bottles over his head. The junkie fell to the ground. I grabbed the Glock, took the butt end of my Mossberg, and proceeded to bash him in the temple until he was unconscious. Bill handed me a full bag of Marlboros and said to grab as much ice as I wanted. I gave Bill the 200 bucks, handed him the Glock, and told him to get the hell out of here. I wonder if I made a mistake letting that fucker live. What if we cross paths again? Five hours into this, I wasn't ready to kill anyone yet. As I traveled back home, the experience had rattled me. I could have been shot and killed. How long would my family survive without me? Approaching my house, I could smell the steaks. My mouth was watering. My wife asked how it went. I just shook my head. I threw the ice in my Yeti cooler and proceeded to pack it with meat, chicken, and a few drinks. I re reiterated to my family that this is a bad situation and it's only going to get worse. There's no short-term fix. For the immediate future, we'd eat like kings on the grill. I knew what was going to come in the future. The thing that stood out the most this first day was the silence. No planes, no cars, no TV. Just the occasional bird chirping. As the sun set, we sat down to eat. I knew it was going to be a long night ahead, of, ahead for all of us. The day started off like any other. This message is transmitted at the request of the United States Office of Civil Defense. At 3.40 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, NORA detected a long-range nuclear missile launch in North Korea. This missile is believed to be headed in the direction of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. It is believed that it will impact this area within the next one and one half to two hours. All residents within a 400-mile radius of this area should seek a f-
I woke up to that emergency broadcast. A nuke from North Korea had brought on America's biggest nightmare. The country we laughed at finally delivered. I wondered if we were able to return fire. What was going to happen next? Would they invade? Or would some other country invade us? I fell asleep that night sitting in the chair with my AR by my side. Slept for maybe two hours. My wife and kids had slept in their beds. I wanted them to still have some kind of normalcy. The truth is, there would be no more normal. No more 9 to 5 grind, complaining about work, paying bills, and watching my beloved Mets blow late game leads. I walked out on my backyard deck, fired up my first cigarette of the day. Bill had hooked me up with 12 packs. Nicotine withdrawal was no longer a concern. My wife, out of habit, began to make coffee, forgetting the grid was down. I was fortunate, never drank a cup of coffee in my life. I laughed and told her, I won't miss what I never drank. I grabbed some instant coffee from the basement, put a pot of water on the grill, and told her it's the best we could do. My, my daughter's still sleeping. I told her about my experience at the gas station the night before. There'd be no more venturing out for supplies. By today, I figured store shelves would be empty. Looting, chaos, civil unrest would be running rampant. What we had in the house would have to suffice. I told her I had more supplies than 99% of the average Americans. She never believed in my prepping and preparedness. She'd call me crazy and a nut. On day two, she was now thanking me. I grabbed my anchor solar panel charger to keep the walkies and the ham radio charged. My plan today was to check on a few neighbors and solidify our home defenses. To the left and right of my house were two single women. Across the street was Eddie, a divorced father of two, who lived alone. Next to him was Jack, a 70-something retired small-town deputy. The three of us often talked at the mailbox about the economy, politics, and how crazy the world was getting. Jack, being a retired cop, had told me about the handguns he owned. I knew he had also invested in precious metals. Eddie, on the other hand, did not own a firearm. He'd seen me coming home from the range before, asked me about buying a shotgun. He never made the purchase, and now it was too late. I ventured out across the street, AR in tow, and with three out of my four walkies, leaving one behind for my wife. Eddie and Jack were already talking and seeing me coming. Both were shocked to see the semi-auto over my shoulder. I asked them both if they had heard any news. Neither had. I told them we'd been nuked by North Korea, and it was an EMP. It had destroyed our grid. I told him what happened when I ventured out for cigarettes the night before. The shit has hit the fan and we're at war on our soil. The enemy was both foreign and domestic now. People are going to turn against one another over food, water, and shelter. Neither knew I was a prepper, and I still wasn't ready to divulge that information to them. Our suburban neighborhood was only about three miles from the urban city. I told them we need to secure our street and our houses before we're infiltrated by the unprepared. I handed each a walkie, told them we can communicate and watch each other's back. I asked both how their food and water security supplies were. Jack had two handguns and about 500 rounds of ammo. He was okay with food and water too. His one concern was medication for himself and his wife. They had about a one month supply. At that moment, I thought how lucky my family was that no one depended on medication. I knew this was going to last longer than a month, and by the look in Jack's eyes, he knew too. Eddie had a 10 by 20 foot garden in his backyard and a decent supply of water for being a non-prepper. As I said before, he never bought that shotgun, and now with a total collapse happening, had no way to protect himself. I trusted Eddie. We'd known each other five years since he moved in across the street. 
We attended the PGA Championship together when it came to town and watched over each other's houses when we'd go on vacation. I told him to come over and see me later and I'd help him out. I re reiterated to both to reinforce their houses and walk back to my house to do just that. I had boarded up all my first floor windows being careful to leave an opening for my rifle to shoot through. I knew the wood wouldn't stop anyone, but it might slow them down. I drove nails through two by fours and left them at the base of each of the windows. If or when someone came through, they'd have an unpleasant surprise meeting their feet. I knew there were a few houses on the street that could be trouble. We often walked the neighborhood before the EMP. I'd notice the houses with the unkept yards. The people that always seemed to be sitting in their, in their garage drinking beers. Houses where the, the kids looked like they ran the house instead of the parents. One thing I regretted not having was a dog. My state-of-the-art alarm system was now completely worthless. A dog would have been an excellent security system now. At that moment, my eight-year-old said, Dad, I got to go number two. Sanitation was a prep I slacked on. All my buckets were currently full of water. I dumped a five-gallon bucket of water into the pool, put a garbage bag in it, and told her the garage was now our bathroom. <clears throat> Time for a Marlboro. I guess it was time to dig a landfill in the backyard to dispose of the waste in the garbage. I told the family if it was yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, it goes in the ground. On top of running security, I was now the sanitation man. I made the decision to use the pool water to bathe with, the hot tub water we'd use to clean clothes. We still had over 200 gallons of water in the house, a hot water tank full of water, the tops of two toilet tanks, and a small landscaping pond. I was also intent on collecting rainwater. At this point in the summer, we were five inches below average rainfall. The lack of rain wasn't hurting my small garden. Up until yesterday, I'd been watering it twice a day, and the fruits of my labor were beginning to pay off, just in the nick of time. <clears throat> over the walkie, I heard Eddie say he was on his way over. He met me to the gate at my backyard. I told him I'd be right back, and in, within three minutes, I returned with a Maverick 88 and 100 rounds of buckshot. I told him, here... Here's a shotgun you procrastinated at buying. You're going to need it now. I gave him a quick lesson on how to use it and told him, don't be afraid. I trusted him. I felt better knowing two of my neighbors were armed and we could communicate with each other. 24 plus hours into this, my kids with no internet had to resort to board games and playing cards. They were beginning to understand the magnitude of the situation. At that same exact moment, my daughter yelled, Connect 4. I heard the first gunshot since the new kit. I immediately radioed Jack and Eddie. They had heard it too. It sounded too close for comfort. I had my wife and kids go down to the basement for cover. I went to the upstairs window to try and see if I could find where it came from. Boom! Another shot was fired. It sounded like it was coming from the street behind my house. Binoculars in hand, I was scanning between the trees and houses. Twenty minutes passed without another shot fired. The sun was now starting to set. What was it, I thought? Was it someone throwing in the towel already and offing themselves and their spouse? Was it a group of marauders? Was it the local police? Maybe it was the guy from the gas station who threatened to shoot me. It was going to be a long night and daylight could not come fast enough. Day three. 
I didn't sleep at all the night before. I was on high alert after hearing the shots fired so close to my house. By day three, there was no more running water. Temperatures were still running into the low 90s with high humidity. Even though we had a pool, I was reluctant to let my kids out back to swim. Safety was the number one priority now. I even moved my grill to my garage and set it up at the back door. Mountain House scrambled eggs and pancakes for breakfast. I check in with Eddie and Jack at sunrise each morning. Still armed with 11 packs of cigarettes, about 12,000 rounds of ammo, plenty of food and plenty of water. We were in good shape compared to the rest of my neighbors. I harvested some fresh fruit and vegetables from the garden. I'm glad after two plus months of it was producing some results. I had two traps set out back by the garden. I had seen a few rabbits stealing from it. My kids and wife would never eat Peter Cottontail, but I could ill afford to have him eating precious garden resources. Everything had been happening so fast, I hadn't really given any thought to my friends and family. I wondered how they were doing. Were they still alive? I had a buddy that was a former Marine. We had often talked about building a bug out retreat before the EMP. Unfortunately, talking about it was too late now. He was my closest prepper ally. He lived in a rural secluded area about 45 minute drive from my house. With no running vehicles, it was probably a two to three day walk. I told him if the shit ever hits the fan, I was bringing my family and supplies to his house. With no real option, and three days into this, our safest choice was to remain at home. My wife asked me where the police were. I said home taking care of their families. I told her to look around. This is it. There's no help coming for the foreseeable future. At that moment, my oldest daughter said to not. A next door neighbor was walking to our door. I had my wife and kids go down to the basement and lock the door behind them. I wondered if she was alone. Could it be a setup? Things that never would have crossed my mind before the EMP hit. I radioed Jack and Eddie, told them I had company approaching and asked if they could keep a lookout, see if she was alone. Neither saw anything. She knocked on my front door. I was armed with my Mossberg 500, loaded with alternating rounds of sluggers and buckshot. I didn't open the door, instead yelling through, asking her what she wanted. She said she was out of water and had nothing to drink. I asked myself what should I do, turn her away cold-heartedly, or give her water and have her return every time she needed more. I didn't prep for my neighbors, I prepped for my family only. She had nothing to offer me. She was a liberal who often told me how bad guns are. I knew she didn't own any firearms, so I made the decision to turn her away. I told her I barely had enough for a family of four. She was single and lived alone. I told her there was still water in the toilet top tanks, plus additional water in her hot water tank. I had plenty of water, but it wasn't going to last forever. As she walked away, I heard a gunshot. I seen her fall to the ground. Holy shit, my heart was racing. I heard Jack and Eddie over the radio saying there was a group 30 yards from my house who had shot her. Were they coming to my house next? No time for questions. I put down the Mossberg and grabbed my battle rifle. Headed out the back of my garage and around to the front of my house. I took cover behind my car, carefully pulling the charging handle. My hands were shaking. I wondered if I could hit the broadside of a barn under these circumstances. There were three of them. I lined up the red dot, fired my first shot. 
It was a direct hit right in his throat. I quickly fired ten more shots as the other two started to turn and run. I hit both. All three were now down on the ground. I radioed to Jack and Eddie, told them I was okay. Taking no chances, I emptied the rest of my magazine into the three of them. There were now four dead bodies in front of my house. I radioed my wife, who was still in the basement with my kids. Told her I was okay. But the net and three unknown marauders were now dead. Stay down there until I come back in, I told her. I wondered if there were more coming. Were these the guys I heard shooting the night before? I didn't want the body sitting in my yard cooking and rotting away in 90 degree temperatures. I had Jack and Eddie help me pull them into Danette's backyard. Jack stood guard as Eddie and I dug a hole. We buried the four of them. I now had a vacant house to the right where Danette once lived. The three of us scavenged through her house. What little food she had, we split. We took all the hygiene, medicine, and paper products we could find. As we walked out, it hit me. I had just killed three people. I knew it had to be done, but it's still a heavy burden to bear. I told Jack and Eddie, those three won't be the last to cause trouble. We needed to be extra vigilant and on the lookout. The three of us returned to our houses. I wasn't going to lie to my family. I told them exactly what happened. There would be no bullshitting. Honesty could now save lives. I didn't sleep a wink the night before, still struggling with Danette's death. I thought maybe if I had let her in my house, she wouldn't have been shot and killed. Just four short days ago, life was so different. So much has changed since the EMP hit, devastated my city, and what I assumed was the rest of the country. I miss the air conditioning. My mercury thermometer was reading 84 degrees inside my house already this morning. I couldn't help to think down the road to winter time. New York winters were harsh and unforgiving. If there was a blessing, it was this happened now instead of in January. I had two Mr. Buddy heaters and about 51 one pound propane tanks. That was the only heat source we'd have come winter. By now the food in the refrigerator and freezer had spoiled. We'd eaten as much chicken and meat as we could, knowing it would soon go to waste. The ice in the Yeti cooler had long melted too. It's funny, it's the little things you miss first. No more ice cubes means no more cold drinks. When it's 90 plus degrees out, a cold drink does wonders for the morale. I had often debated over getting a generator, but never got around to it. In a situation like this, a generator would be a double-edged sword. Sure, I could run my refrigerator on it, but they were noisy. Everyone in the neighborhood would hear it, and I'd have a giant target on my house. I missed taking a shower. We were now reduced to bathing in the pool. I had more than enough chemicals to keep it clean, but it wasn't the same as turning on the water and feeling it hit your face. My wife and kids were scared after the shooting in front of the house yesterday. They kept asking, what if more of them come? What if they come at night when we're sleeping? Sleep, I thought. I hadn't slept more than four hours since this began. I was drained physically and emotionally, but couldn't let them know that. 
They depended on me. Jack, Daddy, and I were going to have to come up with some kind of plan for Night Watch. I was going to need sleep eventually. After I gunned down the three marauders, I thought of Rick Grimes on The Walking Dead and the question he'd ask new people. How many walkers have you killed? How many people have you killed? Why? I would now have to answer that question with three people. I reassured my family I wouldn't let anything happen to them. I told my wife she was in charge of meals. We'd use up what was in the pantry, cupboards, and garden first before digging into my food prep stashed in the basement. Between what was upstairs and in the basement, between the four of us, we had at least a year's worth of food. I went out on my deck to have a smoke, glanced at Danette's empty house. I'd forgot all about the grill and the propane tank on her deck. Another 30-pound tank would be huge. I decided to go and grab it. In all the chaos burying the bodies in the backyard, I had also forgot about her garden, which is double the size of mine. Cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, watermelons. It was a huge score. I'd picked up a Mosin Nagant that the Marauders had shot and killed Jeanette with. 7.62 by 54R was not a caliber I had stocked. There were three rounds left in the magazine. Finding some more ammo for it would be a top priority. I also pulled a Beretta 90 series pistol off them, chambered in 9mm with a 17 plus 1 capacity. The mag was fully loaded. This was a tremendous score. I had applied for my pistol permit seven months ago and still been waiting on it. Where I'm from in New York, it wasn't unusual to have to wait over a year. In a WROL event, I no longer needed a piece of paper to carry a sidearm. My wife was worried about her mother. It had been four days since they last spoke. Her mother only lived a mile and a half away. She was the closest in proximity to any of our family members. From the look in her eyes, I could tell she wanted me to make the trek to her apartment and try and bring her back. She knew the danger that it would involve. What was I to do? Refuse her request and risk everything to try and reunite the two of them? I radioed Jack and Eddie to have them meet me to discuss my intentions and also set up plans for a security watch at night. The two of them came over, both armed. You did not walk outside without some sort of protection now. I had split the garden score from Danette's yard up to give each of them some fresh fruit and vegetables. I couldn't take care of the whole neighborhood, but was damn sure going to take care of both of them. Our first matter to discuss was night watch. We decided the three of us would alternate each night standing guard. Jack was in his early 70s, but was in better shape than me. I had no reservations. He was a tough old SOB who could handle his own. Eddie in his early 50s, and armed with the Maverick 88 I had given him, would take the first night. I told him my plans to venture the mile and a half to my mother-in-law's. It was fast approaching dinner time, and we all agreed it would be best for him to move under the cover of darkness to make the journey. Eddie would come stay at my house with my family while I was gone. At that moment, we heard a rumble in the sky. It was fast approaching. It was a group of fighter jets flying very low, buzzing over rooftops. I wasn't sure if they were American fighter jets or foreign. They were so low to the ground, my house was shaking. We immediately headed inside for cover. I decided to check the ham radio to try and find any info. I turned it on, 
I heard the United States government was in the process of setting up FEMA camps in every major metropolitan city with a population of, population of over 225,000. They said the military and National Guards had been depleted by the lack of manpower and resources. There were also reports of marauders and assailants blocking roads and killing the unprepared who were wandering for help. Some sick form of survival of the fittest, I guess. At that moment, the broadcast cut out and an emergency alert played. What follows explains the fighter jets. Things just went from bad to a whole hell of a lot worse. The emergency alert of the Russian invasion was the last thing I wanted to hear. We now had domestic marauders and a foreign invasion on American soil. I thought to myself, maybe this is all one shitty nightmare. Let me pinch myself. Nope, this is the real deal. SHTF, WROL, whatever you wanted to call it. The recovery mission to my mother-in-law's just became even more risky. What if the Russians started bombing my town? How was the American military going to respond? Surely some of their fleet was affected by the EMP. Darkness was quickly beginning to set in. We hadn't heard any more jets since the original group passed over. Maybe they were heading west towards Buffalo or Cleveland. I decided to go ahead with a 1.5 mile trek to my wife's mother's apartment. I could bike there, but that would be risky. I'd be spotted easier. The decision was made to hoof it. I grabbed my chest rig, loaded with six spare magazines, chambered in 5.56, my AR-15, the Beretta 90 series I picked off the Marauders, a walkie-talkie, in my get-home bag. If I got into trouble and was stuck, that bag had everything I needed to survive a minimum of three days. Eddie on night watch would position himself in my front yard behind some now overgrown bushes. My eight-year-old daughter did not want me to go. She was hysterical. I promised her Daddy would be back in a few hours. I had planned to Planned to return home by daylight. I told Jack, Eddie, and my wife I'd only radio them if I ran into trouble. I kissed my daughters and my wife goodbye for what I hoped wasn't the last time. I shook Jack and Eddie's hands, told them to say, stay safe, and keep my girls even safer. 
It was pushing 10 p.m. when I left my house. I had a good seven plus hours of darkness for cover. The shortest and quickest journey would be the main roads. It was about 400 yards from my driveway to the main road due south. This was my first time venturing out since day one when I had the incident at the gas station. My heart was beating fast. I was extremely nervous. I had no idea what to expect or what I'd run into. I thought about going through backyards, but was worried someone protecting their home would shoot me. I had four cars broke down on my road. I'd use these for cover till I got off my street. I had one more thing against me too. It was a full moon. With no street lights, it's amazing how, how much light the moon projects off. I could smell wood fires as I maneuvered down the street. I also could see candles burning in the houses. These people had no awareness and no idea of OPSEC. As I got out onto the main road, there were cars and trucks littered everywhere. Wherever they were when the EMP hit is where they now stayed. I decided I'd use the cars and trucks to my advantage and weave in and out, using them as cover, staying as low to the ground as I could. 200 feet down the road, the smell hit me. It was the smell of death cooking in 90 plus degree temperatures the past few days. I grabbed a bandana from my bag, tied it off to cover my nose and mouth. As I approached the vehicle, all I could see were hordes of flies. I was doing everything I could not to vomit from the smell. It was an older lady, deceased inside. She was covered in flies and maggots. I glanced quickly, but saw no blood or visible wounds. Perhaps she had a pacemaker that gave out at the exact moment of the EMP strike. Further down, I could see and smell what I assumed was a house fire. With no fire department, it was left to spread to adjoining houses. One mistake with a candle could now take out a row of houses. It could also have been marauders burning people out of their homes. That was now my biggest worry for my own house. The two fire extinguishers would be no match for a burning, raging inferno. As I carefully approached the burning home, I could see the siding on the neighboring houses beginning to melt from the heat. The house to the right was still occupied, and the people were starting to exit it. At that moment, my biggest fear became reality. Gunshots rang out as the people who lived there made their way outside. Some sick bastard was burning them out and then taking them out. I took cover behind the closest broken down vehicle. The shots continued to ring out. I could see a fire in the road about 75 yards down due west and what looked like downed trees and telephone poles blocking the road. I saw the glow coming off the barrel of a gun positioned behind the trees and poles. I didn't want them to hear chatter on my walkie or risk them hearing me radio Eddie and Jack. I quickly shut it off completely. I had no idea how many of them there were. I could see six to seven bodies on the ground in front of me at the house they were getting burned out of. The gunshot stopped and I heard a voice say, Burn the next one down! They were throwing Molotov cocktails at houses and burning people out. The voice sounded eerily familiar, and then it hit me. It was the same voice from the gas station. The junkie who held me at gunpoint to rob me. What had I done? I let that piece of shit live on day one, and now he had killed at least a family of six. On day five, I wouldn't make the same mistake. The objective of, of the mission just changed. Every decision you make in a time like this has consequences, one way or another. The adrenaline was taking over. Stupidly, I didn't give a thought to how many people he was with, 
My one goal was to kill him. As his partner stepped close to the next house to start it on fire, I was concealed behind a car now 50 yards from them. I opened fire, quickly dispersing him. The Molotov cocktail fell to the driveway, breaking and starting on fire. One down, not sure how many left to go. Return fire came immediately in my direction. There was now a shootout in the middle of a suburban street. But I had the advantage. They were partially blinded from the fire smoke in front of them. I emptied a non-compliant New York State 30-round magazine in their direction and decided to try and flank them by maneuvering northwest behind a row of houses and coming out behind them. He was still shooting down towards the car I had been taking cover at. He was the only one I could see. It was one-on-one -on -one now, and he had no idea I was closing in behind him. I heard him mumble he was out of ammo. I decided to pounce. With his back still turned towards me, and me coming from behind a house to his left, I fired two shots at his lower body. He fell over still alive. I carefully approached and asked him if he remembered me. He didn't. Probably because he was high as shit that first night at the gas station. I told him that was a guy who tried robbing at Sunoco for $200 the moment the world went to shit. I told him for everything he's done, he deserves a bullet between the eyes. But I wasn't wasting another round on him. I pulled out my United States Marine Corps K-Bar and just about decapitated his sorry ass.